All right, so it is five o'clock uh, and I'll begin reading our, our script to get going. Uh, so as a preliminary matter, this All right. Uh, so as a preliminary matter, this is Ashley Arisman, chair of the Nantucket Conservation Commission. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Mark Beal. Here. Seth Engelborg. Here. Uh, Arisman's here. Ian Golding. Here. Dave LaFleur. Here. Maureen Phillips. Here. Joe Topham. Here. Right. Uh, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Jeff Carlson. Here. Joanne Dodd. Here. I anticipated speakers on the agenda. Please respond in the affirmative. Uh, looks like we have Rob McNeil. Here. Uh, Brian Madden. Here. RJ Turcott. Here. Uh, Chloe Coggins. Paul Santos here. Oh, Paul Santos. <laughs> uh, Art Gasparro. Here. Uh, Taylor Donovan. Here. Dan Bailey. Here. I'm not sure. RJ Turcott. Here. Thank you. Um, all right, so good evening. This open meeting of the Nantucket Conservation Commission is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable pub public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Uh, for this meeting, the Nantucket Conservation Commission is convening by video conference via Zoom app, as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Uh, please note that this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and to take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless I note otherwise. Uh, we are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or your computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in a conversation with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. And after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment as follows. Staff will activate the chat feature on YouTube. Members of the public who have comments or questions can use this feature to communicate with the public body. Instructions are on the town's website. The chair and or staff will do their best to address questions or comments. And finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. So with that, uh, we will open this meeting to public comment on items not being heard this evening. Um, Jeff, do we have any public comment? Uh, at this point, no. Okay. Um, well, I'll go ahead and read uh, tonight's continuances. Uh, under notices of intent, we have Sconset Trust Incorporated, Linden Avenue right-of-way uh, is continued until July 8th. Um, 
believe that's it for the continuances. Uh, so we will begin tonight uh, under notices of intent, the town of Nantucket DPW Surfside Beach, uh, represented by Stephen Reichert uh, and Rob McNeil. Uh, and Commissioner LaFleur is recused from this one. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, just really quickly to put on the record, this was the site that the commission conducted the field viewing at on Monday um, to review the site. Yes, we did. Um, Rob, do you want to take it? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank you and the rest of the commission uh, for their time uh, this past Monday evening <clears throat> um, to uh, tour the, uh, the site at Surfside and review the, uh, the site as described. Um, I think it was certainly a, a helpful opportunity from my, uh, from my perspective uh, to share uh, the thoughts and uh, uh, the foundation, I guess, of the, of the plan before you. Uh, I know that previously the commission had shared uh, some of its concerns and I'm uh, hopeful that uh, we can have some constructive uh, discussion this evening uh, and feedback to uh, ultimately bring this, uh, uh, this NOI to a, and public hearing to a close, um, or at least bring us uh, back with a revised plan uh, that would be uh, acceptable to move forward. So with that, I'm happy to uh, solicit some comments and questions uh, that may still be with the commission. Thank you, Rob. Uh, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Seth, and then Mark, I'll go to you. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, Rob for having us at the site visit on Monday. Uh, it appeared when we visited the site, a few issues sprang to mind. The first is that behind the current deck where the proposed um, addition to the deck is, it appeared that the area had been either mowed or brush cut. Um, it's been raised by the applicant that one of the primary reasons for wanting to uh, add on to the deck is to restrict access into the dune. And I, I know I've raised concern about this before, but it appears to me that um, what was characterized as people trampling over the dune in order to reach the beach access path was instead more of a facilitated um, issue where the, the uh, resource area was not managed in the correct way, allowing people to access that area. So I have, I have definitely have concerns about that. Uh, I do agree that we need to find a constructive way to minimize further access going forward. But if um, the applicant or someone on behalf of the applicants uh, did kind of unpermitted work that needs to be rectified before we move forward with this notice of intent. This, the second issue that I saw, it's not an issue per se, but it, help, it may help us uh, draw to a resolution, is that I noticed just south of the proposed deck area, there's quite a large stand of Japanese black pines, which is a species that in the state of Massachusetts is not considered invasive currently, but on Nantucket has been shown to act highly invasively and has been proposed based on the data solely from Nantucket to MIPAG, the Massachusetts Invasive Plant Advisory Group. Um, I, I understand that the waiver requ requirement being requested is the long-term net benefit. Um, so I think there's a possibility to get at that net benefit in multiple ways. I think the moving of the uh, wastewater or the storm, storm drainage system helps. I think blocking off the access helps. And I think potentially doing a 
full-scale ecological restoration, which includes uh, invasive or aggressive plant species removal could help. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Uh, Mark, you had had your hand up. I did, yes, thank you, actually. Uh, and thank you, Rob, for the site visit uh, a few days ago, very helpful. Um, I would second what, what Seth is saying about trying to have limit the access or eliminate the access uh, uh, to the, uh, I guess the west of the building there around where, where it's been mowed there or, or, or weed whacked. Uh, that would be important to not have that continue. Um, we looked at and measured some of the options there when we were there together. And I, I, I appreciate the idea. It's a waiver project, which was not planned, but now is. And I think um, uh, we mentioned last time a, a nine foot deck might be more suitable uh, if that gets uh, more cooperation from the, uh, the commission. But I, I think 12 is, is a lot to ask, uh, particularly for a waiver. I, I think I can live with nine, uh, move the cantilevers back the appropriate amount so it makes sense uh, uh, engineering wise, but not have them be out nine feet, have them be, be moved inside. Uh, and, and that to me would be a, a project I could live with. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Are there any other questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Joe and then Seth? Yeah, I agree with Mark, but I actually was wondering you know, they were gonna replace the doors anyways to the bathrooms. Could they just swing the door around and shift the showers over to the west elevation and reduce that deck back to like six feet? It allows for a handicap if someone was in a wheelchair. It just seems like there should be some modification. That deck is going to be massive and I don't think it's really necessary. And then there's a existing split rail fence. And I think that needs to run all the way to this building or to the new deck to stop anyone from walking around the front of this uh, property. I just think that needs to be stopped right now. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And I'll go back to you, Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also do wanna just add some follow-up comments about the accessibility piece of the project. Um, at the site viewing, it became quite obvious that the site is highly constrained with other uses, concessionaire uses, parking, um, bus stop, uh, seating. I understand that, but I, I still do believe that the idea of needing to bring people to the back side of the building in order to have a accessibly accessible watershed view, it, it's not um, really a necessity based on what we saw at the site. You have a beautiful view from the parking lot itself. And I, I think there are ways to maybe reconfigure some of the uses and not have that deck at all. But um, I would be more comfortable seeing the deck if the things I mentioned before were taken into account. Thank you, Seth. Uh, any other comments or questions from commissioners? Uh, I know I um, kind of echo what um, Seth and Mark and Joe have said. Um, I, you know, when I saw the site, I felt like the deck was almost to serve the needs of the concessionaire more than looking at the building holistically. Um, and I am still, you know, very uncomfortable with such a large deck expansion. Um, and honestly, really any expansion of the deck into the resource area at all, given how evident it was that the whole building needs a renovation. Um, and I just think pushing into the resource area before the whole building is, is done, um, just isn't the right thing to do uh, for protecting our resource areas. Uh, but I do think the aspects of the project, you know, uh, fixing the drainage um, and definitely roping off the uh, walkway or drivable area to get down to Surfside 
uh, is very important for the long-term maintenance of this site uh, and to ensure that you know these resources at Surfside are there for the public to enjoy you know in, in perpetuity essentially um so i i you know um i'm definitely hoping if you guys still want the deck that we can see a pretty substantial redesign um joe so just quickly while we were you were talking i did this <laughs> can you see it oh. no it's it's going into your background oh, damn it. hold on shut up my background I feel like this is a little like Wizard of Oz. We're going to get to see Isn't it? behind the curtain. <laughs> All right. So what I, oh, that way. Basically what I was saying is like reduce that deck down to five feet and then shift the ramp over. So it, it minimizes a lot of that impact on that far side. It still allows access. But then you just swing around the showers to the east, the west elevation. And then you just add that access door. Because right now the two doors to the, to the bathrooms are in swinging and these new doors are going to be out swinging. So they're already going to do construction on the building. So why not just tweak that? So that was my thought. And I could share this to Joe or Jeff. Thank you, Joe. I think since you shared it with the screen, it needs to go through um, the staff too. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, thank you for that architectural uh, perspective. Um, any other thoughts or comments from commissioners? Maureen? I, do, I would just like to, um, I appreciate all the other commissioners, very thoughtful comments. And, and Ashley, especially what you said about the timing of this, since there is going to have to be, you know, essentially a rebuild of this um, to take a step into the resource area first, as opposed to stepping back literally um, and looking at the entire project to see how the deck can be reduced, I think makes much more sense than trying to, you know, do the deck first and then kind of figure out how the rest. There's so many other constraints um, on in the property and for this building. And I think before we start changing that, we should look at before we start adding to the deck, we should look at the entire building footprint and how that's all going to operate. So thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Jeff? Sorry, I, I just wanted to make a point of clarification just because I don't want anyone to be, con be confused. So the, the deck that's being proposed is being proposed within the buffer zone to the resource area, not specifically within the resource area. If that makes sense. I don't think it makes it still requires a waiver, but I don't want people to be confused or the public watching to think that it's going into the dune when it's in the buffer zone. Just wanted to clarify. Yeah, thank you. That's an important clarification. I think um, I I should have been saying within the no build uh, zone. So um, thank you for clarifying that on the record. Um, if there are no other comments or questions from commissioners, uh, we'll look to public comment. Uh, Jeff, do we have any public comment? No. Um, okay. Uh, so, Rob, uh, what would you like to do here? Would you like to try and go back uh, to the drawing board as far as you know, reducing the deck and possibly um, taking into account some of these other suggested changes? Sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess the other point to make here is um, as we looked at the deck and the adjacent slope, uh, the idea was to uh, use the deck as a uh, definitive uh, uh, way to prevent passage behind it. Uh, so. It, I guess that's the, that was the hope is to you know bring it out far enough that it was um, and that's the cantilevered section certainly uh, to prevent people to fit from physically being able to walk behind it with the split rail extended to it or the rope and post uh, being extended to it from either side uh, or not but the, the 
I guess the um, I'm happy to go back to the drawing board and I'm, I'm eager to take a look at uh, Commissioner Topham's version of um, what he's considering or contemplating here. Uh, and all the comments, I, I do appreciate the feedback. Um, I just want to make sure that you know we're we're clear on the goals and objectives here, so that uh, ultimately we we are only providing what's necessary to achieve that, and and nothing more. Um, Thank uh, you, Rob. Um, so I was just thinking it might be helpful for us um, to maybe get a copy of written correspondence with the concession ear, just so we know that they've been notified that they should not be mowing just because I think they, it, from the site visit, it appeared that they were maybe the majority of the problem. Um, and I think that would be helpful uh, if they had some messaging sent to them. Uh, Ian. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, you know, I, I have to say when I was out there, well, I, I, I share the concerns of my fellow commissioners. It, what Rob has said about using the cantilever deck to change the pedestrian traffic uh, really resonates with me. And in the, in the grand scheme of things, when you think how many people go down there and how many people occupy um, that part of the island every summer, um, I, I feel that if, if we want to reduce the profile of the deck, so be it. But I, from, from my point of view, I felt that it made sense. So um, I, I would approve it the way it stands with, um, with Seth's request that that be part of the order of conditions. Um, so it's sort of, it, I, I have this feeling that it's like Don Scotus and Thomas Aquinas, how many angels are there on the, you know, can dance on the head of a pin when you put it in that larger perspective. You know, my, my sympathies are with, them trying to make this work there for the for for what it entails. So thank you. Thank you, Ian. Madam Chair, I would uh, ask for a continuance. Uh, we'll take a look at the information as presented and make uh, whatever requisite changes uh, based on the comments received. So once again, I appreciate the feedback and input from all commissioners. And uh, we'll, we would um, respectfully look for uh, continuance the next time. Okay, so thank you, Rob. Would you like to continue two weeks to June 24th? Sure. Okay, so this will continue for two weeks. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, so that moves us on to Randolph G. Sharp Junior Trust at 49 Meadowview Drive, uh, represented by Brian Madden, uh, and I'm not sure if we have Don Bracken on as well. Just me. Okay. Um, for the record, Brian Madden from LEC, representing the applicant. Uh, based on some comments we received at the last meeting, uh, we made some modifications to the proposed pool and overall site design to confirm that we have the two foot separation to high groundwater for the pool. Uh, so we, what we ended up doing was raising the grades up a foot in and around the structures. And then uh, we are proposing to reduce the pool depth to four feet uh, to achieve that two foot separation. And um, with that, um, I'll turn it over to questions, but I believe that address the, the commission's request. Thank you, Brian. Uh, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Uh, Jeff, do we have any questions or comments from the public? All right. 
Uh, well, Brian, thank you for um, making those changes. No uh, Jeff, do we have everything we'd need to close this one? Yes, you do. Okay, Brian, would you like to close? Please. Is there a motion to close? Motion made by Dave, seconded by Mark. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman I. Golding. Aye. Lafleur. Aye. And thank you. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. Uh, and that moves us on to Drake Real Estate LLC at Two Hornbeam Road, also represented by Brian Madden. Uh, thank you uh, for the record, Brian Madden. Um, at the last meeting, uh, I believe all that we were waiting for was the natural heritage determination letter, which uh, we did receive and um, for the uh, no adverse impact and the no take. Um, so um, again, no waivers proposed in this project and um, turn over to questions. Thank you, Brian. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Jeff, do we have any comments from the public? No, when you do have everything you need. Okay, perfect. Uh, Brian, would you like to close? Please. Is there a motion to close? Motion made by Ian. I'll give the second to Maureen. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Uh, aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Lafleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to 87 Eel Point Road Realty Trust at 87 Eel Point Road. Uh, I know Commissioner Engelborg is recused from this one, uh, and it is represented by Brian Madden. Uh, thank you very much, um, Brian Madden, for the record. Um, at the last meeting, um, there was a request made to add some more beach grass uh, in lieu of lawn along that northern property uh, or northern limit of work uh, within the 50-foot buffer zone between the 25 and 50. Um, I, I did get recent uh, authorization from the, the property owners I uh, didn't get a chance yet to um, submit any revised plans, but um, basically um, cutting the the difference between the um, the 25 and 50 foot to revegetate with American beach grass. So um, I have a sketch, but maybe I could just talk you through it. It basically um, the far north westerly. Uh, corner of the limit of work, just drawing basically a straight line across um, to the east. And that basically um, gets you mid, midway through the 25 to the 50 foot. Um, so the property owner uh, would be more than happy to revegetate. Exactly. Something like that. Everything north of that. Um, and so hopefully... Um, that answers or addresses the commission's request and I'll turn over to questions. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and thank you for uh, asking your clients about that. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Ian? Um, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, so through you to Brian, could we have something a little more specific? Yeah, um, I mean, I do have a plan in front of me I could um, show on the screen very quickly and then we can submit a, a plan um, by the end of the week, certainly. Thank you. Um, yes, Brian, do you wanna share that with us? Yeah, let me make sure. I... Let's see. Folks see that? Yes, we can see that. So yeah, that basically just uh, cuts the difference between the 25 and 50 foot and, and draws more even line filling in some of those northerly bump outs. 
Thank you, Brian. Thank you. The visual is definitely helpful. And apologies, wasn't able to get that um, in earlier. Okay. Um, any other uh, questions or comments from commissioners? Like, no. Jeff, do we have any comments from the public on this one? No, and you do have everything you need to close as well. Okay. Uh, Brian, would you like to close? Yes, please. Uh, is there a motion to close? To close. Motion made by Joe. Is there a second? Seconded by Mark. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Uh, Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. Uh, so that carries with Commissioner Engelborg <laughs> refused. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to Gallagher at 34 Washing Pond Road, represented by Art Gasparo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm before you tonight with a notice of intent for the application at 34 Washing Pond Road for work within the Coastal Bank resource area, as well as the buffer zone to the Coastal Bank. Uh, this is the site that I believe you're all familiar with from uh, the notice that we did uh, about a year ago uh, to remove the existing uh, structure, patio, stone walls, and um, the new development that's happened on the residential redevelopment. The owners moved all of the work, uh, structural work outside of the 100 foot buffer zone, which you can see on the plan. I've shown the uh, 25, 50, and 100 in, uh, in red and the, um, the structures uh, to the south of, of that. The um, proposal before you tonight is to have a, a path and a set of beach stairs down to the beach. There was a set of beach stairs that previously existed at this location. Um, and I've included photographs of the, uh, of the support, all that's really left are the supports uh, at this point. So we're looking to go right in that same exact location where the, um, where the old beach stairs were. Nothing unusual about the um, about the beach there. It's pretty pretty standard access just to get to the beach, and then I would point out that uh, there has been um, extensive restoration of the buffer zone. Uh, the owner has planted thirty thousand beach grass plants uh, in this area, and um, part of it was uh, that's under the order of conditions for the when the house was removed. But uh, it's, I, I just have to say it, it's really impressive and it's, it's quite a uh, uh, improvement from the conditions that previously existed where you had, you know, brick walls and patios that were fairly close to the top of the bank. Um, and I'd be happy to, the other um, aspect was the only uh, plantings that are proposed are uh, the black pine and the Eastern red cedar that are shown outside of the 50 foot buffer zone for a small bit of screening um, along the westerly property line. And then, um, you know, the, the grass path to get to the, um, uh, to get to the stairs. And with that, I'd be happy to address questions or concerns that you may have with the application. Thank you, Art. Uh, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Seth and then Ian. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Art. Um, no issue with the path or the beach stairs. The one concern I have is with the proposal to plant Japanese black pines. You may have heard a little bit earlier in this meeting, but that species is, uh, un it's in the early stages of the process of being brought up to my PAG for a hearing as to whether it should be listed as invasive in Massachusetts or not. Uh, so it currently does not have an invasive status, but since it's going to be the plant of a discussion later this fall, I would feel much more confident if a different plant was used, say pitch pine or just more of the eastern red cedars that are already proposed there. If the applicant is willing to make that change, I would 
greatly appreciate it and don't see any issue with the rest of the application. Thank you, Seth. Uh, Ian? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, are, are these stairs going to have uh, handrails? Yes. Uh, they're required by code. All, all stairs have handrails. So um, I, I would like to see a cross section so that we see what it's going to look like. OK. I, I don't currently have an architectural drawing of them, but we can put something together. Great. Thank you. Art. Uh, any other questions or comments from commissioners? Mark? Well, through the chair, uh, Art, what is the success rate of the American beach grass? Um, so through you, Madam Chair, it's, uh, they're, they're currently growing. You know, it's, it hasn't been a whole season where you could essentially evaluate a, a survival rate. But in general, do you, do you know, Art, what I, it is? No, because it's, uh, you know, I don't think you would know until um, after a growing season, which plants are, you know, uh, successful and which have, have have died. But we could certainly have uh, a condition of some sort to, you know, provide a report uh, on those on those plantings. They were a very significant investment. The owner, I've had several discussions with him about them. So I, I know, um, I know that the, uh, the care and the growth of uh, establishing them are very important to him. That kind of question. All right. Um, any other uh, questions or comments from commissioners? Um, I know I, I have to agree with Seth. Um, when I looked at the plan and saw the Japanese black pine, that was you know, really the only thing that st stuck out to me as um, negative. Um, so um, it would be great if that can maybe be revised, but everything else um, seemed, seemed good to me. Um, Jeff, do we have any comments from the public on this one? Oh. Uh, Not on YouTube, but I think RJ had a comment. Yes, I just saw his hand go up. So uh, RJ. Thank you. RJ Turcott for Nantucket Land Council. I just have a quick question for Art through the chair, if I may. Um, on the landscape plan, it says existing vegetation to remain as possible on the right side of the path. I was just curious what was meant by that. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Yes. So uh, to the east, there is uh, the, you know some of the areas that hadn't been disturbed. I think that there is, um, uh, you know, some, maybe some bayberry. I have not, you know, great on all of the, couldn't tell you exactly what's up there, but they didn't go taking out the vegetation that was sort of off to the east and previously existing. And so the intent of the plan was to show that, um, uh, like I said, there's plenty of poison ivy um, in there too. Um, but essentially that the, the disturbed areas are what was planted with American beach grass and the area that as part of the removal of the other structures and moving up sort of to that mounded area to the east, the, the, note, the intent of the note on the plan was essentially that that was just to be left alone. Thank you, Art. Um, Jeff, I'm assuming we don't have any public comment at this point. Okay. Um, so Art, are you going to provide uh, a diagram of those stairs? Yes, ma'am. If I could request a continuance to uh, the next meeting, please. I will uh, just uh, check on the, what plant species they want to sub in there instead of making the, you know, I, I would think it would be to go with the cedar, but I appreciate the, I'll, I'll defer. There is a, um, uh, landscape designer on the project. So we'll defer with them, update the plans and also work to get the um, an architectural cross section for you to view on the beach stairs. Thank you, Art. So this will continue until June 24th then. We're Thank waiting you. for a phone number on that as well. Madam right. Chair, so. All right, so that uh, moves us on to 46 Union Trust at 46 Union Street represented by Paul Santos. Thank you. 
behalf of the applicant 46 Union Trust. This is a notice of intent filing for proposed renovations to an existing dwelling with an addition um, of a deck on the um, easterly side of the structure. And this, and then also uh, the addition of a pervious parking area along Meter Street. And this all occurs within land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, there is a landscaping component uh, to the application also. Um, just by way of location, the property is um, a historic property located at the corner of Union Street and Meter Street. Um, it's an existing dwelling um, that is to that has recently been sold. And the intent for the new owner is to renovate the existing dwelling uh, within the footprint of the existing structure. Uh, they plan to remove the existing deck, which is located along the easterly side of the structure. It's a portion of the area that you see shaded on the plan in front of you. Uh, they will be expanding that deck, um, removing the section along Meter Street, and then expanding the deck along the, along the easterly end of the dwelling. Um, currently, parking for the property is typically uh, along the edge of Meter Street. Uh, Meter Street, as many of you know, is a narrow um, street. It is, I believe, a two-way, um, but and there is some gravel parking along the, uh, the edge that currently exists. What we're looking to do there is um, create a new um, pervious parking area along the north easterly property line, if you will, for two car parking along uh, on the property itself. The, the property itself is basically fully developed. Uh, it's either dwelling um, or a lawn area um, uh, that exists today. Uh, what we'd like to do along the area in which that gravel parking presently exists is loam and seed that area, but in doing so put grass pavers or some type of grid system within that area. Uh, Meter Street is very narrow. There are cars sometimes that do pull off over to that side area. Uh, there are cars, sometimes cars that will park in that general area. So what we'd like to do is get rid of the gravel component of it, uh, put the grid in, but then um, have it appear to be a lawn area. So in case in the winter months or in case um, when there's two cars coming down the road and people are pulling over, we're not compromising um, the newly uh, graded lawn area. The landscaping component, uh, the owner has um, retained uh, Ben Shampoo. The plantings that you see on the plan were uh, discussions that uh, Ben, Chloe and I had with regard to uh, what we'd like to do on the site. Along the northerly property line, they would be removing some existing privet and a sycamore maple, uh, replacing with native plantings of sweet pepper bush, beech plum, inkberry, blue flag iris, joe pie weed, swamp mallow, and red maple. Along the Meter Street property line, would be removing an existing post and rail fence uh, that is lined with arborvitaes. Um, that would be removed to make way for the proposed pervious parking. And then uh, they would be adding Virginia Rose along uh, the relocated um, fence line. Um, the application itself, again, is strictly within land subject to coastal storm flowage. We did mention in the application that the property to the east, uh, there does appear to be a uh, vegetated or an isolated wetland kind of associated along that easterly property line. It's never been delineated on any um, previous plans and it's not been confirmed, but, um, and obviously it's not on our property, um, but we do, we are comfortable that everything that we're showing you here would be outside any regulatory um, setback, you know, if that line was ever um, established uh, and confirmed. Uh, we would be outside of the 50 foot no build um, clearly with the decking um, and that area is a developed um, lawn also that's an that's an existing vacant lot that's uh, that's an existing lawn area um, so that is the application we are not um, subject to any review under the mass endangered species act uh, it's strictly a um, filing within land subject to coastal storm flowage with uh, no waiver requests uh, required. And I'm happy to answer 
any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you, Paul. Uh, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Jeff? Sorry not to interrupt. Uh, I wanted to kind of add on to what Paul said is we've done a, a site visit and kind of preliminary look on that adjacent lot to the east. Uh, someone was trying to evaluate whether they needed to bring in um, a wetland specialist or not. Um, and we met someone on that site independent of this project completely. It was, it was probably, um, Joanne can correct me if I'm wrong, probably a year to 18 months ago, I feel like. It's, it's been a while. Um, I would confirm it does appear that there is a vegetated wetland on that lot to some degree that even leaves the brush area and probably comes out into what's currently um, kind of a lawn area just from kind of poking around the soils. But I do agree with Paul. I think that everything that they're showing is probably outside of the appropriate setback that would be requiring waivers. So I think that the parking area would probably be outside of the 25 and the structure is, is well outside of the 50, just from kind of a guesstimate of where that is on the site, kind of a guesstimate to the property line. So I think his assessment is correct without having an actual delineation on that lot, that that, that resource area assessment is probably pretty close. Thank you, Jeff. Um, any questions or comments from commissioners? Well, it's like, no. Jeff, do we have any comments from the public on this one? We do not. Uh, do we have everything we'd need to close? Yes, we do. Uh, Paul, would you like to close? Yes, please. Is there a motion to close. Motion made by Mark, seconded by Joe. So by roll vote, Beal. Uh, aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Lafleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to EPR RGH LLC at 119 Eel Point Road. And I know Commissioner Engelborg is recused from this one as well. Uh, and it's represented by Paul Santos. Uh, thank you. Again, on behalf of the applicant and property owner, EPR RGH LLC, Paul Santos from Nantucket Severs. Uh, this is a notice of intent application for 119 Eel Point Road. Um, this application has not been before you previously. Um, the property to the west, 119 our Eel Point Road um, was before you for um, a notice of intent for redevelopment of that particular property. Um, actually, I do stand corrected. This was before you um, with regard to a RDA to establish the resource areas previously. So 119 and 119R were filed separately. So an RDA was filed um, to establish resource areas here. The resource area in this particular case is uh, the Coastal Bank um, associated with Nantucket Sound. So this application before you is for um, the removal of brush uh, along the northerly portion of the property, which is between the proposed development and the Coastal Bank. Um, it would be a removal of brush from your 100 uh, to approximately to up to the 25 foot no disturb. Uh, that area itself um, currently consists of a, um, a cut lawn walking trail. Uh, the rest of the area is basically invasive honeysuckle, poison ivy uh, within, that, within that area. The plan that you see um, depicts the green area as the area that we're talking about. Everything to the south of that is outside of your jurisdiction. So th this lot um, is currently being developed, but they kept everything on that property outside of the 100 foot setback uh, to the coastal bank. Um, so the septic system, dwelling, second dwelling, pool, and so forth is all um, outside of jurisdiction. The front of the lot from the um, approximately where the septic system is to Eel Point Road is actually mapped under um, the Mass Endangered Species Act. And we had sought and received approval uh, to do limited amount of work in the front to cut in that existing driveway. That driveway 
uh, was placed generally in the same area where the previous disturbance was for a, a power source, the electric line going into the structure. Um, so we do have um, NHESP approval for the work in the front. It was outside your jurisdiction, so we did not have to come before you. So the application itself is basically to clear cut and uh, replace with lawn the area uh, between the 25 and the 100, the only regulated area being the, uh, the coastal bank itself. And I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you, Paul. Uh, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Um, looks like no, Paul. So are they going to like just cut all the brush or are they gonna grub the soil? Um, well, I would assume they would, they would cut in grub because I think the, the intent is to cut it and then uh, replant with, I'm assuming with, a, with, with a, what would be a lawn area in that area. Um, so, um, but it would, be, it would be cut and grub. The intent was to take out the, the, inv in the invasive honeysuckle. So. Okay. Um, and then I guess I had another question. With the, it looks like the silt fence or construction fence is right on the top of the bank. Um, and I was just wondering if that could be almost the delineation of the 25. I'm just worried. Um, that no, there it, is the, it is the 25, actually. If you look, it says where it says proposed construction fence, the arrow goes to the 25. Okay, so I just misread it's, the plan. Where it says proposed construction fence. Okay. Yeah, and then the arrow does go. So the, the construction fence would be, because obviously we would stake that first so they didn't go into it. Okay, um, thank you for clarifying. I think okay, I was looking um, at the top of yeah. the, seeing the wrong line. Uh, Mark? Yes, through the chair, Paul, would this be an opportunity to plant some American beach grass as we got near the coastal bank? Um, yeah, I'm sure they could, you know, incorporate some, some type of planting in that particular area. Right now, it is vegetated all, all the way. Um, the honeysuckle does go all the way up to the the top of the bank. Are you talking about the bank itself, Mark? Or are you talking about the interface in the in the twenty five? You're talking about the, the, the coastal the, bank the, itself. No, not the coastal bank itself. That's 20, 25 to fifty range. I'm sure we could. If I, I'm sure there's some type of rather than just have this be all straight lawn. I'm sure if I went to them and asked them to come up with some type of landscape plan that that ha had maybe a transition from a lawn into the twenty five foot buffer. I'm I'm sure that's something that they could um, that they could work out. There is a there is a grade change in there. It's it, you know it does part of the 25 does um, slope up to the top of the bank and then it drops down um, from there. Um, so I'm sure that you could they'd be willing to come up with some small buffer between the 25 and the in the proposed grass. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Ian, I thought I saw your hand go up. Uh, you did, Madam Chair, through you to Paul. Um, I would very much um, echo what Mark requested as looking at the Google overhead. It, you know, I would like to see a transition, I think would be much more sympathetic approach. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. I, I uh, agree with both of you. Um, it is a little bit, for lack of a better word, harsh to see all that cutting right up to the 25. I agree as well. Um, if there are no other comments or questions from commissioners, we'll turn it over to the public. Jeff, do we have any uh, public comment on YouTube? Um, oh. RJ? Thank you, Madam Chair. RJ Turcott for the Nantucket Land Council. I just echo what uh, commissioners have already said about trying to get some native coastal vegetation on the bank, especially if in the future this applicant wants to put a staircase in and a pathway, uh, it would definitely be for the best. So thank you. Thank you, RJ. Um, so Paul, uh, are these um, items you think you can bring back to your client? Yes, I'm, yes I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm happy to continue and come back with a, with a, with a little plan to show you what we know what you what we discussed. I think that's fine. 
Okay. Um, so would you like to continue for two weeks until June 24th? Yes, please. Okay, perfect. So this will continue until June 24th. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to Swartz at 153 Pulpus Road, uh, represented by Jeff Blackwell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this project has uh, three main elements. Um, the first and, and most significant is the um, abandonment of a old conventional septic system whose leach trenches are less than 50 feet away from the um, vegetated wetland and to replace that system with an entirely new IA system where the uh, new leach field will be placed um, something like 82 feet away from a uh, vegetated wetland on an adjoining property. Um, part of the replacement of the septic system will also involve the installation of a new well that is more than 25 feet away from the wetland um, to be placed in an area that is already um, a lawn. And the final element of the project is to construct in addition to the house and uh, a small portion of the, uh, the addition is um, about 90 feet away from the wetland. So the, um, the project does require a waiver to place the new leach field um, uh, less than 100 feet away from the wetland, but there is no other place to put it. And um, the new leach field and IA system will provide a long-term benefit to the um, wetlands in the area and to the harbor. Um, that's that's the long and the short of it. I will um, address any questions you may have. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Uh, do we have any comments from the public? Do we have everything we'd need to close this one? Yes. Uh, Jeff Blackwell, would you like to close? Yes, please. All right. Is there a motion to close? A motion made by Dave. Is there a second? Seconded by Joe. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Lafleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. Right, that carries unanimously. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks all. That uh, moves us on to Winthrop Nantucket Nominee Trust at 9 Salem Street. Uh, and it looks like we have um, Peter Braverman from Winthrop listed, Katie Kudsman from VHB, William Tabor from VHB, and we have Dan Bailey uh, and Aidan Colnane uh, as legal counsel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dan Bailey from Pierce Atwood. Um, yes, you've uh, you saved me uh, the trouble of introducing the team. Thank you. Um, we've got um, our full team from VHB here. I'll just elaborate a little bit. Uh, Bill Tabor is the tank farm engineer. Uh, Katie Kudzma is the uh, licensed site professional uh, for the hazardous waste conditions and the soil and groundwater at the site. Um, and Taylor is our, our wetland scientist. You'll be hearing primarily from Taylor and Bill tonight. Um, I'm just going to introduce the, the project. Uh, Taylor will then talk about, you know, the, the wetland resource areas, which is you know, mostly land subject to coastal storm flowage and a little bit of buffer zone to bank. Uh, Bill is then going to describe what the project is uh, and some of the details. And, and Katie's available if you have questions regarding uh, the, con you know, the environmental condition of the site. Um, Joe, can you start with the first slide, the uh, one that shows the, uh, the air photo? Um, I'm sure this isn't anything anybody 
uh, really needs to see. But uh, just if there's anybody in the audience who is not familiar with it, I'll quickly uh, give the setting here. Uh, this is the former Harbor uh, Fuel Tank Farm. Uh, it's been in this location for about 60 years. I am also going to apologize if you hear banging in the background. I happen to be having a roof done and they were supposed to be done an hour ago and they, I, I have not been able to get them to leave. So if it gets, uh, Madam Chair, if it really gets interruptive, I'll go out and I'll get them to leave. But I, I've done a couple of other Zooms today. It's been okay. Yeah, uh, we, we can't hear anything so far. Okay, so good, good. Uh, they're driving me nuts. But um, anyway, thank you. So this is a former Harbor fuel tank farm. It's a roughly million gallon, 11 tank tank farm, uh, served as many years for many, many years, 60 years as the primary storage supply storage source for uh, uh, petroleum on the island. Uh, the Harbor Harbor Fuel leased it from my client first Winthrop for many, many years. Uh, that lease expired at the end of 2019. And for close to two years now, uh, Winthrop working with Harbor Fuel um, and with the Nantucket Boat Basin uh, has been reconfiguring um, the, the land in that area uh, and preparing to remove the tank farm and remediate existing contamination that's in the soil and groundwater. I wanna be really clear that the proposal that is in the NOI and what's before you tonight only involves removing eight of the 11 above ground storage tanks. We don't plan to do any remediation. Um, we need to, you know, while we have a pretty good understanding of soil and groundwater conditions at the site, we need to get in and get these tanks removed so we understand what's underneath the tanks. Then we will be back before this commission before we do any uh, actual remediation of, of soil or groundwater at the site. Um, so you see the tank farm right next to it is the stop and shop and the stop and shop parking lot uh, for uh, a very long time until uh, about a year ago, um, just before the pandemic. Uh, it was the last meeting I had on Nantucket. Uh, the planning board approved an approval not required plan uh, that separated the tank farm from the stop and shop from the stop and shop parking lot. They had all been part of a single lot going back to the, uh, back to the 50s. Um, we did that in order to isolate the tank farm. Um, so we could go forward with removing tanks, cleaning it up, et cetera. Uh, I think it's pretty well known that the stop and shop and the, the parking lot were sold to Nantucket Island Resorts uh, that closed in December. Uh, so um, two of the tanks, uh, long-term will be replaced um, down in that lower left corner. Um, those uh, tanks are going to stay for now because they provide the uh, marine fuel for the tank farm, uh, but uh, those will eventually be replaced. And, and, and like the remediation, that's something that uh, will have to come before this commission. Uh, I'm going to now turn it over to Taylor and ask her to get into the wetland resource areas, and then she'll move on to Bill. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, yes, yeah, so if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, and so here we have our uh, FEMA ferment map um, showing the flood layers, and so. Um, if you take a look at the red pin kind of towards the center of the map, that is the project location. Um, and so you can see that the entire site is within land subject to coastal storm flowage, uh, zone AE, um, and it's at elevation 10 um, of 10 feet. Um, and then on the next slide. Um, so it's a little, a little bit hard to see, uh, but on the project plan um, on the right, you can see a dashed yellow line. I'm going through the project location and that is the 100, <laughs> thank you, Joe. Um, that's the 100 foot buffer zone to Coastal Bank. Um, and so we are in the outer 50 feet um, of the 100 foot buffer zone um, to uh, the Coastal Bank there. Um, and I think Bill will just walk us through the proposed work and then I can go into more detail about what is in the jurisdictional areas.
Hello, my name's Bill Tabor. I'm an engineer with VHB. And what we're looking at is the layout for the above ground tanks at, at, the, uh, at the tank farm. Um, starting from the north end, we anticipate coming in, cutting a 15 to 20 foot section from the dike wall in order to access the tanks. Uh, basically what we'll be using is like an excavator. Instead of having a bucket on it, it'll have a giant pair of shears or scissors used for cutting the tanks into steel sections. Those sections will be placed onto flatbed trucks and removed from the island uh, to a uh, steel scrap yard for uh, recycling. Same thing with all the piping. We've already started disconnecting the pipes um, at this point and anything we can get at physically with uh, staff inside the, uh, the tank farm. Um, we've been working with the fire chief uh, from the very beginning on this. Um, he comes through and we have him do regular inspections. Um, we've been working hard to make sure we stay within all the requirements um, for uh, the tank removals um, and making sure that we're not having any issues uh, with any contamination that may be in the soils. Um, Typically, what I would say we'd be starting with, if you look at the picture, M2, then S1 and S2, and cleaning that area out initially to get all the tanks and the piping out, um, and then working on removing the internal uh, concrete dike walls. You can see that they're in red internally. Then we'd be able to remove the tanks, what would be M3, M4, and M5, um, basically removing everything up to that point. The dark line at the just below those three tanks is a six foot concrete dike wall internal. Uh, we need to maintain the dike walls around tanks, what are S6 and M1, which are diesel fuel and marine gas for the boat basin. And those, that area will need to be maintained until such a time as the two new tanks have been uh, approved and can be constructed. And that's kind of an overlay of what's happening with that. Um, also, there's some assorted concrete pads and piping supports and that type of thing that would also be removed um, from the inside the diked area um, and removed from the island for uh, recycling uh, on the mainland to kind of give you an idea of what's, what's ha what, we in what we anticipate for the work inside. And if Taylor, you want to go into to detail of which parts of this. Sure, yeah. Did you want to talk at all about the um, site investigation or? Well, that's, we're going to be doing a site investigation. Unfortunately, we can't get in and do that work until such a time as all the tanks have been removed. The site investigation will entail the sampling of soils and groundwater inside the, the diked area. Once we're opened up, we'll be able to get some, some drilling equipment in and be able to collect the samples at that point. If, if I could jump in here, Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. Thanks. Just to, you know, uh, maybe I, I know there'll be, be questions about the environmental conditions. So maybe just to give a little bit of information on that and then when there are questions, uh, you know, Katie can respond to them. Um, you know, this site has, uh, you know, a considerable petroleum contamination, um, you know, not terribly surprising given the industrial nature of the site for over 60 years and the use. Um, it, for the most part, is in the soils. There's some non-aqueous phase liquid contamination and there's contamination in the groundwater. Uh, there, um, uh, uh, it was one of the first sites reported to DEP back in the 1980s. So it's been tracked by DEP ever since then. The site has always been 100% compliant with DEP regulations. I've personally worked on it for, for 25 years. It was the first thing I ever worked on in Nantucket. Um, and uh, it might be the last <laughs> by the time we get it cleaned up. But uh, it... Uh, you are, my client's intention is to uh, fully clean it up in accordance with uh, MassDEP regulations. Uh, 
there's groundwater testing and monitoring done annually uh, here and reported to DEP. Um, so uh, it's a site that we've, we've really stayed on top of. Uh, it was one of the very first sites in the Commonwealth to achieve what's called a, a temporary solution, which is a, a regulatory quasi endpoint. You know, you, you are allowed to have a temporary solution. Uh, and this site is kind of a poster child for that type of thing, which is you just can't fully assess it and remediate it until the tanks are removed. And in order to qualify for a temporary solution, you have to demonstrate through data and through an LSP opinion that there's no substantial risk of harm to human health, safety, or welfare. And we've been through that process three times with DEP uh, because temporary solutions have to be renewed every five years. So, you know, I, I, I just wanted to provide a little bit of framework that um, environmentally, yes, this needs to get cleaned up, but it's, it's very, uh, a site that we've been very much on top of for a long time. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so are sorry, there... I we, I'm sorry, I, th I think we're gonna go back to Taylor quickly. Okay, uh, Taylor, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to, I guess to walk through a little bit more what um, proposed work is within the wetland resource areas. So it's uh, listed out here, um, but as I mentioned before, the entire site is land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, so all of the proposed work is proposed um, within the uh, within land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, so that includes the demo and removal of the eight fuel tanks, the piping and pads, um, removal of the interior um, and the exterior section of the dike wall and the post-construction site investigation. Um, but then within the 100 foot buffer zone to coastal bank, um, that only includes the demo and removal of two of the fuel tanks um, with their associated piping and pads um, and the removal of one of the interior dike walls. Um, in addition to the site investigation. Um, and just, we wanted to highlight that as a result of this project, um, there would be a, an approximate 4,800 square foot reduction in impervious surface within land subject to coastal storm flowage. So, thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, your parts in the presentation. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners at this point? Uh, Ian, and then I'll go to Joe. So thank you, Madam Chair. So um, to Dan, so you mentioned that this is the first project you worked on in your experience in Nantucket. And coincidentally, uh, as a teenager, I worked for Lyle Rickard and Mike Lamb when um, the marina was being built and the, the sand was so saturated with um, sort of oil and gasoline that uh, someone ignited one of, the, one of the projects when we were hacking away at it with a pickaxe to dig in there. So I'm sure it's still very polluted. But uh, my question is, um, are you expecting any sediment in the tanks themselves when you're cutting them open? And how is that going to be dealt with? It might be better for me to answer that yeah, question. Thank you, Bill. Um, we have already cleaned out nine of the tanks. And for the most part, we didn't have much of a sediment issue, but the tanks have been completely cleaned out. There is no sediment or anything in the tanks. Um, as part of the process at the end, we have a marine chemist come through and he certifies them gas free so that you can enter the tanks and do work on the tanks. Uh, in addition, we've talked with the fire department and gone round so that we've managed to keep the tanks open enough to allow them to aerate since they've had, you know, 50, 60 years of gasoline and diesel fuel storage in them. Um, they, it does tend to get into all the cracks and everything else, but they're basically clean, no fuel in them and no sludge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll go to Joe. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, just a general question to the group. Um, so you're going to remove a couple of dike walls. What happens if there's a flood while you're doing your testing and waiting for the new tanks? Will it be closed up or what's the safety measure that will be there? And I, 
I worked there as well <laughs> back in the early, late 80s. Um, and so I do know that there is an elevation change, but I can't remember the distance. But uh, I was just curious if there was flooding, what would happen in that area? Thank you. Uh, the easiest way, the center of the tank farm is actually a little lower. So everything tends, when you have a, rain, a heavy rainstorm, it tends to drain to the center of the tank farm normally. Now, this condition you're talking about would be as if we had literally floodwaters coming in, that would be higher than, you know, the edges of the tank farm. What we'll have is the 20 foot, 15 to 20 foot section that's opened up. The dike walls will remain um, around the rest of it. And the intention is, is normally, you know, it would be open when we have people working there It'd be a chain link fence tied down to the concrete when work isn't going on to make sure that nobody can get in or out of the tank farm. But in addition to that, if we know a heavy storm is coming, we have the capabilities to stand, sandbag or to place some materials along the base of the concrete that's opened at this point to prevent floodwaters from entering. That's our intention. Plus, when we've got trucks coming back and forth, we'll be cleaning, you know, the tires and whatever we need to do so that any of the soils or whatever don't get spread out of the tank farm during having equipment and materials coming in and out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maureen? Um, first off, I have never worked on the tank farm. So. <laughs> <clears throat> so you're lucky there. Um, but reading through this incredibly complicated project um, and all the layers and um, parts you're going to have to, you know, part A happens and then part B happens while part A is finishing and all those intersections. What I kept thinking about was um, how you're going to monitor all these reports and all these things that need to be kept clean and moved in the right way and taken off in the right way and and what kind of monitoring will be will you be doing and what kind of reporting will you be making available to both us and other uh, town entities like the fire department who will have you know concerns about how this is going because I didn't I didn't see anything about that <clears throat> Well, typically we would have someone there. You'll, we've got working with a, a good contractor that does this type of demolition work so that it's not, you know, this is some, a type of work. These tank type of tank removals, uh, are, they're experienced with, so they know what they're doing. Uh, in addition to that, we'll have an engineer on site part of the time observing, taking pictures. Depending on the type of work that's being done, we may need to have a police detail out there um, or a fire detail, uh, plus the fact that we'll have the fire department. We let them know what our schedule is, and they've got no problem swinging by and checking things out and taking a look around themselves. Um, so it's not like the contractor is going to be out there on his own uh, unchecked. We'll have engineers and others there observing what's going on. Uh, recording what's going on um, and documenting what needs to be what needs to be documented um, to provide any reports that are required. Uh, uh, thank you uh, to the chairs to follow up. Um, yes, uh, Bill, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and I, I guess what I'm getting at is what can be expected. You know, you the. Um, I mean, typically, what I'm really getting at, obviously, is how would we know that there was something, you know, that wasn't going right? And, uh, you know, I'm a recovering lawyer, so I always worry <laughs> about the worst possible thing, you know, that can happen. And, and getting major projects to, to report on a... Um, uh, regular basis isn't always the easiest thing for us, you know, like it, it sometimes it's pulling teeth to get a reports out from, from um, major projects. So how does, you know, how, how is that going to happen and kind of what's your threshold for um, 
you know, something that would need to be reported that's out of the ordinary or what have you? I mean, how do you set those thresholds and, and how would we know what they are? Um, Cause obviously, you know, I mean, your, your construction crew, they all know what they're doing, but it's more we as people who don't undo tank farms all the time, you know, what I need you to tell us what it is we should be getting from you. And, and I guess that's, that's what I'm asking for. Okay. Um, I wish there was a nice, simple answer to that. Um, we are required to follow uh, Mass DEP, US EPA, OSHA guidelines for this work. So from a standpoint, we monitor air uh, quality with uh, what's called a PID and it scans for volatile organic vapors. Uh, we'll also check for dust, typical construction. If it gets dusty, we put down water to, to knock the dust down. Um, a lot of it's standard construction type work. Um, basically, they're handling heavy steel pieces. Need to make sure nobody's ever under any of the pieces when you're moving them to put them onto a truck or whatever. Like I said, there's a lot of you know basic OSHA safety that we need to follow. Um, for this portion of the work, we're really not getting into the soils so much. So a lot of okay. the issues you're concerned about aren't there yet um, till we start getting in and dealing with uh, what's we know what's in the soil and how we're going to deal with it. Um, but basically, you have trained construction supervisors. Reporting is going to be you know, if there's a spill of more than 10 gallons, that's a two hour report to the DEP. Um, anything that causes a danger to the public, uh, we need to report to either the fire department or the police department. Um, there's a, it, it's pretty standard stuff. I don't know what you're looking for. I can't give you a, you know, what it, what particular emergencies, obviously we're not anticipating anything other than physical construction hazards and making sure that any soils don't get blown up into the air um, right. or spilled. We can, we monitor for dust. We'll put water down if that happens. Um, and like I said, we'll also check for uh, organic vapors in the air using a PID. Right. Um, and those types of things. So that would be normally what we would be looking for. Uh, just one more follow-up, if you don't mind, Ashley. Um, so Bill, that, that, that all makes sense to me and, and I appreciate that. So um, I guess what I'll just, my concern and, and obviously, I mean, this is obviously a really complicated project that eventually will you know, be dealing with contaminants and, and obviously it's in one of the most crowded areas of the island where right. there's going to be people and cars. And I see you're gonna be using the stop and shop parking lot as part of that will be, you'll take some of it for the, um, the staging, staging area, delivering, you know, things back and forth and, and all of that. So it's obviously gonna be very obvious to the public and their concerns. So I just wanted to, to make it clear. And, and I, I know you know this, but to make it clear, that this is going to be a you know avidly followed project, and we will be looking to you to be keeping us well informed, and and of course you do all the things that are legally necessary. But it really we want to set up a, a relationship of trust and mm -hmm. you know working together. So, um, so I, I appreciate everything you've said, and and I, I feel comfortable now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark, you've had your hand up. Yes, I didn't want to feel left out. Um, I, I too have worked in the boat basin under the tutelage of, <laughs> tutelage of Joe Lopes. Uh, one big storm, we had some kids inside the tank farm with a, a charcoal grill going because it was too windy outside. And Joe, Joe had a cardiac moment with that one. I can imagine. Um, anyway, um, uh, I, I would to sort of echo what, um, what Maureen was saying. I would maybe hope this will be a uh, off-season project. Uh, yes. Some are trying to operate down there with heavy trucks and uh, 
taking out parking places and just moving equipment around would be, I think, traumatic for you and the town. Yes. Is there any justice in that thought? Basically, we would be looking to do this off season um, with all our approvals and anything. We're not going to be out there tomorrow trying to, to set this up. Um, I think we're anticipating mid-September, thereabouts, uh, getting started with this as the as your tourist season is uh, is ending because we we don't want to be in the way of your of your tourism business at all uh, stop and shops not going to want us being in their parking lot when they're at their busiest um, i guarantee you they're not going to want us there <laughs> um, so we've got to talk with them to make sure we're all set and on board with them with what we're using and we're not interfering with them in their business and one follow-up if i may actually uh Yep. Have you been monitoring the, the, the test wells that are around this site? Yes. We just literally back in, uh, in May um, sampled all of the, the wells and submitted the report to the Mass DEP. And they have been monitoring those wells on an annual basis for years now. Um, so I have a question and then Ian, I just saw your hand go up. Um, so two things actually, I guess, um, obviously this kind of needs to be done in the off season because of the, you know, population that you deal with in the tourist season. But at that same time, the off season is when we get more flooding and storm that you guys would be up against essentially. And then, um, my second kind of question, we received a letter from, um, the fire chief and he mentioned, firefighting foams that had been put um, on this site. And I'm just wondering, like when you have possible PFAS chemical contamination yes. and then petroleum chemicals, um, are we gonna be on level with like a, a super fund type site? I would not anticipate that, but yes, we're aware of the firefighting foam and the most likely there will be some PFASs in the soils. Um, I don't anticipate it being super fund level, but we haven't done any testing yet. So I, I can't give you a for certain answer one way or another until we've done the testing, but yeah, we are aware of the PFAS and expect to find it. Okay. And uh, if I could jump in on that just quickly. Yeah. Um, the, this is one of the few areas on the island uh, that is not part of the sole source aquifer drinking water supply. So it's not a, a you know, regulated groundwater one site and PFAS, um, you know, much like out at the airport where it has gotten into the groundwater. Uh, it, it's, a big, it's a problem no matter how you have it and we'll have to deal with it if we do find it, uh, but it's worst typically when it gets into groundwater that is used as a drinking water supply. And fortunately, that's not what we have here. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with you some, you know, as far as human health, but if, if PFAS is getting into the harbor and then it's getting into fish and life in the harbor and then we're fishing those fish and then it's moving up the food chain. So yeah. no, no, it, it accumulates. Yeah, yeah I understand. A, a forever chemical. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, no matter where it is, I, you know, it's definitely an area of concern. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you guys are ready to address that once you do your soil yeah. work. Right. We, we realize we're going to need to look for that and test for it and we will be. Okay. Um, Ian, I saw your hand go up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It was really a tangential comment just um, in terms of timing that uh, Rob McNeil of the DPW couldn't get his thermoplastic painters over for the summer because of the steamship being completely booked. And uh, I don't know how many months into the fall that will continue, but yeah. it's becoming a real issue for all sorts of um, commercial endeavors. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for letting us know that. I know it's been very difficult recently I'm hoping that it gets a little better when we get into September, but obviously if we can't get equipment over, that's just going to push our schedule further out. Right. Thank you. Any other uh, thoughts or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. 
Jeff, do we have any comments from the public on this one? Uh, we don't have one on YouTube. Uh, I was going to say, I, I know the fire chief sent his comments late today because he wasn't able to make the meeting. Um, I was going to read that in, but if, if everyone has seen it or has gotten it, I'll spare everyone the, the three minutes of reading. Okay. Um, yeah, the only thing, would it be good? I don't want to make you read out loud, but um, just for the public that might be watching, I don't know what sort of public viewing we have now so that they would get to hear the letter or see it. Yeah, or we can, I mean, we can post it in with, with materials as well and make it publicly available. So okay. that's probably easier. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so if there are no other questions or comments from commissioners, Jeff, do we have everything we'd need to close this one? Yeah, you have all of the required information unless there's any like outstanding questions or anything. Okay. Um, I don't think there's any outstanding questions. Um, Dan, would you like to close tonight? Yes, yes, we would, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to close? Motion made by Dave, seconded by Joe. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you to all of our presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that uh, moves us on in the meeting to amended orders of conditions. We have Snowden at 11 Massachusetts Avenue, represented by Jeff Blackwell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is a project that was discussed two weeks ago and was um, continued because we did not have a response on the MISA application. That response has now come in and it was um, uh, mainly concerned itself with um, piping plovers. So the construction will not take place during the uh, nesting or fledgling period for piping plovers. Um, there is one change to the plans. I've submitted a revised plan because the Snowdens reminded me that in fact, they did ask for a handrail on one side of the boardwalk. Um, the Snowdens are of an age where they would appreciate uh, the ability to steady themselves once in a while. Um, so that is, um, the handrail will not um, come down to the ground surface. It will be elevated along with the uh, rest of the boardwalk structure. So there will be no effect on the uh, salt marsh by the, um, the handrail. And um, I will answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, it looks like Ian has a question or comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. To, so to my fellow commissioners, I went out there two days ago to have another look. And uh, you can see from the Jackson Point Pier, you can look back towards there. And it's basically, it's, it's a more or less uninterrupted view back over the wetland and the marsh there. And I'm emphatically opposed to a handrail. And um, I would like to suggest that we have a site visit um, before our next meeting so that we can, um, so that you can see why I am strongly opposed to a handrail. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Joe? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, yep. Jeff, uh, if we are gonna have a site meeting, could you do us a favor? Could you put up some flaggings just at the, top of the rail light you'd like to have, just so we can see it, where it would be uh, the elevation, the heights, et cetera. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments from commissioners? So uh, there is at, at the moment, so the previous owners had a boardwalk that would go out there during the summer and then be brought back in. And so there are actually posts that delineate um, 
you know, the where the former path w w was. So um, anyway, thank you, Madam Chair. Th thank you, Joseph. Thank you both. I know um, I'm a big believer in the importance of, of wetland scenic views. So um, this probably would be a good one for us to, to look at. Um, Maureen? Yeah, just a, a quick uh, comment as a, a person of a certain age who recently broke her leg, um, there are times when you do need that help and handrails have really been, in, you know, really important to me the last couple of months. So I think we've really got to, you know, balance that. It's a, uh, I obviously, I totally agree that's Matticut. I mean, you don't want anything disturbing the view at the same time. Um, I don't like to deny people the ability to enjoy, um, you know, further exploring a place because of a, a disability or a, a concern about adding to a disability. So I think we need to, you know, I'd like, I, I look forward to the site visit, but I, we really need to keep that um, foremost as well, because there's more and more, you know, as we boomers keep getting older, there's more of us and we need to be aware of making the place accessible in a thoughtful way. So thanks. So Thank you, uh, Ian. So Maureen, we're not making it accessible to the public. We're making it accessible. We're discussing accessibility issue with the actual owner of the property, which is entirely different from, in my personal opinion, from talking about general public access. And as someone who will be 74 in a few weeks, um, I, I know what you're talking about, believe you me, but our purview is not to make life easier for boomers like ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, any other comments or questions from commissioners? Looks like no. Uh, Jeff, do we have any public comment on this one? Um, looks like RJ, you have a comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. RJ Turcott for Nantucket Land Council. Uh, we would strongly discourage the commission from permitting this boardwalk. Um, I've seen that path myself. It is currently going over sand. It's not cutting into the actual peat of the salt marsh right now. And we believe that a permanent structure there, um, with, even with helical pilings that's going into that peat, uh, would be really detrimental to the salt marsh itself there. Uh, it's in a low-lying area. It's right essentially on the railroad tracks for even a category one storm coming through and knocking it loose. Um, and there's already access uh, to the beach. And since it's just a private access for a single family home, it's not gonna see the kind of traffic that a sand path would, uh, that would erode it enough to really harm the salt marsh more than a permanent structure would. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective. Um, so, Jeff and Joe, um, is this one we think we could schedule a site visit, I guess for uh, June 21st would be that Monday? Yes. Okay. I, I was just gonna say not to get off topic really quickly, but I think now that the state of emergency is ending in five days, we probably to some degree can go back to kind of a regular site visit schedule where we meet and go through the list as opposed to having to kind of jump through hoops. So maybe that will be the day. We can talk about it later too. Maybe we'll meet down at the office here and see if there's any other sites to go to, but we'll make sure we go to that one as well. Okay, thank you. We have to kind of return to normal here soon at some point here. They're gonna make us. Yes, I think that'll be a nice return to normal, so. Um, Jeff Blackwell, uh, are you all right with continuing this for two weeks to allow for a site visit? Yes, I will uh, plan to um, uh, place some visual reference points uh, as requested. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, there will be, I know there'll be another discussion about this. Um, I think that, <clears throat> The safety element, uh, I, I understand the concern about the view, but um, 
there's also a significant safety element and um, the, the rail itself uh, will have no effect on the salt marsh um, at all. The, the installation of the boardwalk will improve the quality and health of the salt marsh. So um, it would be, um, I think, difficult to um, trump the safety element uh, simply on an aesthetic view, but let's see what everyone sees on the 21st during the site visit, and I know we'll have another meeting to discuss. Okay, um, thank you, Jeff. So then this will continue until June 24th and we'll plan on a site visit on June 21st. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, so that moves us on to Jeffrey Lee at 15 Aurora Way. Uh, and we just need to move to accept a withdrawal. Uh, so is there a motion for that? Motion to accept. So motion made by Joe, seconded by Mark. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Lafleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. All right, that carries <laughs> unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to request for determination. We have Sally Horchow, trustee at 27 East Tristam Avenue, represented by Brian Madden. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian Madden, representing the applicant. Um, the RDA is to confirm the vegetated uh, wetland boundaries uh, located on the subject parcel um, that's just located uh, southeast of Diana Beach. Uh, there is some flood zone and some coastal dune in the northwesterly portion of the site um, that we're not seeking confirmation of those boundaries on uh, because the vegetated wetland boundary basically loops around uh, the property as you can see on the site plan. And um, with that, I'll just turn over to questions. Thank you, Brian. Um, Jeff, has staff been out uh, to check out this site? Yes, we have, and, and we agree with the delineation would recommend that positive two-A on the resource area boundary for the vegetated well. Okay. I would say too, if it makes a difference, we could probably confirm the flood zone because uh, it's shown and it's just a mapped area, but that's up yeah. to you guys, so. Okay, um, thank you, Jeff. Uh, so if there aren't any questions from commissioners, is there a motion to issue the positive 2A? A motion made by Maureen, seconded by Seth. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Lafleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to minor mods. We have Gallagher and Aguiar at Four Pond Road, represented by Paul Santos. Um, thank you. On behalf of the property owner and applicant, Kathy Gallagher and Mark Aguiar, uh, this is a minor modification request. Um, we had previously sought an approval and received an approval for um, work at Four Pond Road. Uh, the minor modification request is to eliminate uh, a proposed one-story garage of approximately 528 square feet. It's shown in a grayscale on the plan in front of you, just above the area that says lot 57, uh, with the area that um, Joe's pointing to at the present time. We're going to eliminate that structure and uh, construct a 16 by 20 foot shed instead of 320 square feet uh, and place that shed outside the 50 foot no build, uh, but within the area uh, of the existing, that's already a disturbed area where the existing driveway uh, currently is. So uh, minor mod elimination of a 528 square foot garage slash shed structure and um, downsizing, uh, no waivers are required or requested. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Paul. Uh, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? 
looks like no. Uh, Jeff, do we have everything we would need to accept the minor mod? Yes, you do. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to issue the minor mod? Motion made by Mark, is there a second? Seconded by Dave. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to certificates of compliance. We have Nantucket Islands Land Bank, uh, Lovers Lane and Clifford Street, represented by Art Gasparo. Mm, he might not be here anymore. That's fine. It's pretty straightforward. So this was one of the, the three sets of stairs that we've recently permitted for the land bank. Uh, to redo, this is the one down in Surfside, uh, kind of where Lover's Lane curves um, before you get over. Uh, they've been reconstructed, and you know we feel after inspection that they are in compliance and constructed uh, where they were supposed to be. It's nice that they're not all rickety anymore. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so are there any questions from commissioners? Um, and if not, is there a motion to issue the cert? Motion made by Dave, is there a second? Seconded by Maureen, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Harrisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. Right, that carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to MLR3 LLC at 45 Shakamo Road. Um, Jeff, are you gonna take this one too? It's listed as Don Bracken. Sure, no, I'm happy to, to do it. So just to, to jump off the bat, this was for the driveway on the Locust um, to be brush cut and kind of installed, not the project we recently permitted dealing with the roadway. So. I know when we first came in and I saw the name, I was like, that was incredibly fast, but it is a different project. It was the original permit for the on-site work. Uh, so just as a reminder, this was the driveway uh, that extended from the existing kind of traveled way up into the lot. Most of the work is outside of jurisdiction for the bulk of it. Uh, the stuff that was in and done <coughs> was in and done within the permitted footprint. And uh, upon inspection, we feel that they met the requirements of the, the order of conditions and that the certificate of compliance for this project is issued. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so if there are no questions from commissioners, is there a motion to issue the cert? Motion to issue, Madam Chair. Motion made by Joe. Is there a second? Seconded by Dave. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to Salvatore at 111 Hummock Pond Road. Uh, it looks like Jeff Carlson's taking this one too. Certain section for me tonight. Uh, so this was for the installation of a septic system on a lot back from 2002. Uh, the Board of Health issued its Certificate of Compliance back in 2009 uh, on the structure, kind of by our inspection, it looked like the site was uh, still in compliance. The brush around the site looked like it was in the right spot. It hadn't been expanded or, or into the wetland areas. So I think we feel comfortable issuing the Certificate of Compliance on this lot as well. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so if there are no questions from commissioners, is there a motion to issue uh, the cert for this one? Uh, motion made by Beal, seconded uh, by Topham, so by roll vote. Uh, Beal? Aye. Uh, Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. <laughs> unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to orders of conditions. Uh, and Jeff emailed those out this afternoon. So hopefully uh, you guys have those. Um, and we will start with Randolph G. Sharp. 
at 49 Meadowview Drive. All right, so just to kind of catch up, sorry about that. Uh, this was for the project we closed out tonight where they <coughs> revised the plan to raise those grades up a little bit and shallow the pool to not need the waiver anymore for the two foot separation of groundwater, but it's essentially for the residential development there. So I included uh, kind of what our new set of standard pool conditions are for the, the treatment being limited. Um, and then that last one for the contact information for the maintenance company and then providing notice before any sort of uh, draining or discharge from that pool. Thank you, Jeff. Are there any uh, amendments or thoughts from commissioners? Uh, and if not, is there a motion to approve as drafted? I move, Madam Chair. All right, motion made by Joe. Is there a second? Seconded by Dave. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to Drake Real Estate LLC at 2 Hornbeam Road. Yep, so this was uh, for a similar residential kind of development on Hornbeam there. Uh, again, it involved the pool, so I had kind of our standard pool conditions. And then something that we've seen a bit lately um, are AC units and pool utilities that get put kind of right up against that 50 foot setback. Um, and we've seen a couple where pieces of equipment have landed on the wrong side of the setback line. Um, so I just wanted that condition, I was just going to recommend that condition 24 just to memorialize the AC units and pool equipment have to be outside the 50 in this case because they're right against it. And Joanne and I don't like to make the phone call that says, you need to take out your pool equipment and move it because it's in the 50. Um, <laughs> just put it in the permit right from the start. So that way there's no, hopefully no confusion. Thank you, Jeff. I like that. Yeah, it's good. Hey, otherwise known as pool creep. So, it's just one of those things I don't think that when they're putting it in, you know, they stake out the pool, but I'm not sure that the surveyor is, you know, necessarily staking out where all the pool equipment and stuff is supposed to go and they scale it off of plans. And I think we all know, you know, you scale off a plan that's, you know, a 40 scale plan and you're trying to butt it right up against the 50 and all of a sudden you're at the 48 and surveyor locates it and then they get the nasty call from us. So just trying to help them out. Uh, Mark, do you have a, a comment or do you want to make a motion? i make a comment that is Jeff. I mean, I suggest you have to put number 24 in every pool application we have before us. I think we're probably going to start. This was just one that was, they were showing the area right against the 50. And those are the ones that tend to be problematic. We've seen them before. If they're like it, We've seen other ones recently where they've been in like 85 or 90 feet. They've been on like the opposite side of the pool from the wetland that we hadn't included it. But on the ones that get close, we've been starting to, but I'm happy to add it into all of them. I think it's a wonderful suggestion. Thank Never hurts. Um, so if there are no amendments, is there a motion to issue as drafted? Uh, motion made by Ian. Uh, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Maureen. So by roll vote, uh, Beal. Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to 87 Eel Point Road Realty Trust at 87 Eel Point Road. Uh, and I know Commissioner Engelborg is recused from this one. So this was the one that, that Brian showed us the revised plan on where they had kind of scaled back um, that there. So I'll need to update the plan of record to reflect that amended, the, the altered plan. Uh, but I don't think it necessarily changes the conditions outside of that. Um, 
So this one, we obviously have some findings that there's work that's outside of jurisdiction uh, that the building, the building department always requests from us so they don't have confusion. And then <clears throat> I kept the condition about the pool not being drained or discharged into an area, uh, which we've been doing because the pool, while it's not in jurisdiction, just wanted to memorialize that for them to make sure they know they can't do that. Um, and then just some photo monitoring requirements. Um, on the beach grass that they're looking to plant. Thank you, Jeff. Um, are there any thoughts from commissioners on this one? Uh, and if not, is there a motion to approve as drafted? Uh, Mark, are you making the motion? Okay, so motion made. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Joe. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Ersman, aye. Golding? Aye. Lafleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. So Just that. One, oh. one quick question: Who's the iPhone with a camera? Just curious. Sure. <laughs> okay. It's just, oh yeah. It's, it's kind of strange. Anyways. Um. So that uh, carries with Commissioner Engelborg recused, and now we have a mystery on our hands too. I think it was Jeff Blackwell, but yeah, I think it, you might be right. Oh, sorry, yeah. I, we had something strange happening here. What was the question? I might be able to answer it for you. I was wondering who was on the iPhone. Uh, that is Jeff Blackwell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so that moves us on to 46 Union Trust at 46 Union Street. All right, sorry about that. This was the flood zone project uh, that Paul Santos had permitted. I didn't really have any conditions that, that I thought of or was recommending for that at this point, but open to <laughs> any suggestions. So Jeff, and I could be totally off here, should this be one that we have a finding that there's a potential wetland offsite that impacts this site or potentially impacts this site? I think we could. Um, let me just see if we can't on the fly here come up with something. Maybe an additional finding number two. Um, we could put the commission finds that it could be off site vegetative wetland. Um, all right, so I think the commission finds that there could be an offsite vegetated wetland based upon information provided by the applicant. the buffer zones which may um, cross the locus in question. So I would say the commission finds that there could be an offsite vegetated wetland based upon information provided by the applicant, the buffer zones of which may cross the locus in question. Thank you, Jeff. I think that um, is a, a good addition just so future commissions, if the site comes back, aren't like what happened here, if there's some documentation. Well, Madam yeah. Chair, through you to um, Jeff, it sort of, does it beg the issue of why there aren't contours to show how close it is? How close is it? So 
in cases like this, unfortunately, Ian, this is one where the wetland itself is located on a separate piece of private property that none of us necessarily have a right to access to. We don't have any records of it. It's never been delineated or filed for before. A lot of cases like this, we've relied upon either old records or something that's there, but it's on a completely undeveloped lot. Um, so I think we all did our best guesstimation based upon, you know, plants that we were seeing in the field and kind of some site topography. I think it's there, but without an actual survey location, I don't necessarily think we know you know, the, the 25 may shift, you know, a foot or two to the left or to the right, essentially, but we just don't have the ability to, to trespass to get that line in totality. Well, I mean, because from the aerial on Google Maps, it looks as though it comes right up to the property line, so. So I, I know from, from our, our site visit out there, and like I said, I've been on that site, is it runs right. I would guesstimate probably about halfway through the undeveloped lot, but we only did, we did some soils work on the lot kind of through there. And I know it, it needed a little bit of refining, but I think going through what we did on the site, I think we were probably pretty close. So I didn't pull a tape per se, but um, right. that's kind of where we were. Again, I, I was hoping that uh, from that field visit that they would have been back out to either file on that lot. It's not, in a, it's a completely different owner. So that they were filing, but I think they were looking to see if there was a development potential on the other lot. Uh, and I think when we kind of walked and saw where the line was, I think they realized pretty quickly that that answer is probably no. So um, they may well, be trying to figure out- Thank you for the clarification, Jay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, any other, uh, Thoughts about this one or questions? Uh, and if not, is there a motion to approve as amended? So moved. Motion made by Ian. Is there a second? Seconded by Dave. So by roll vote, Neil? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Topham? Aye. Right, that carries unanimously. Uh, if I remember correctly, we did not close 119 Eel Point Road. Oh. Um, Jeff, do you want us to discuss the Winthrop um, project? So really quickly before we get to that one, we did close 153 Pulpus. I didn't draft an order for that because it was a, a waiver project, but does anyone, I mean, it, it seems pretty straightforward as a waiver project, but uh, does everyone feeling positive on that? That was the septic replacement um, and a couple of the things out on Pulpus Road there. Um, I'm happy to draft up a positive order for it or a negative, wh wh whichever, but if anyone has any suggestions, I'm happily take them. No, it, it seemed like a net benefit to me to switch over the uh, septic. I thought. I just try not to be presumptuous with waiver projects in case there's questions or concerns. Looks like Mark's given it the thumbs up too. All right. Yep. I'll draft a positive on that one for the next one. So that would then take us to the tank park. All right. Perfect. Um, any thoughts, I guess, on the tank farm? Any and actually, if I may, I, I was amazed the tank farm went through with one hearing. I mean, that's a huge, major project. But really, not not in this round. I think the next round will be the, will be the big project when they start removing soils and finding things. Wouldn't that be the, sort of your your view too? Yeah, I mean, I I'm concerned a little bit about the logistics of the removal of the tanks. Um, yeah, me even, too. even in the off season, uh, but that's kind of somewhat out of our purview. You know, it, it is in our purview, but it's not. Um, I don't know, Jeff, if we need some sort of condition to like button up that site ahead of any storms that might be coming. Like, that's just what I'm worried about is if they start tearing those things apart and then we have a storm when it's kind of in the middle of the teardown. I'm not clear actually if they have a um, uh, uh, concrete barriers 
around just the, the, the entire tank farm or some certain tanks that are surrounded by a barrier. I think it's I, don't know little, that. I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, Dave and then Seth. Okay, you guys know this was coming. I have worked in that tank farm. So that's the fourth. <laughs> that means more than 50% of our board has worked at that tank farm. So over the 20 years of crane work, I've done a lot of work there. And uh, there is a concrete daikin wall that surrounds the whole tank farm. There's intermediate walls in between some of the other tanks. Um, and it sounded like they were going to take it apart in pieces and work their way into it and uh, only have a small opening at the beginning. Um, so and I think that Dan's given it a thumbs up. I, I don't think it'll be a big problem for them to, which they'll have to do. Um, and, and maybe we should see that it's in place and ready to go once that season comes into effect that they could, um, they have the ability to close it off. Because one of the things I wouldn't want to see is uh, flood water circling around inside the tank farm and then washing what's in there out into um, not so secure area that they can't contain. That was, that was my concern as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm concerned with the same. So Seth had his hand up and then Mark, I'll go to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. A similar comment. You know, the applicant representative mentioned that they were going to have a uh, gated fence and then the ability to put sandbags as necessary. But I was wondering if a more intensive um, kind of temporary structure could be put into place, like a, a swale or some type of um, you know, better retaining system and it's way out of, out of my knowledge. I'll defer to someone who knows what that is, but something better than a sandbag. Thank you, Seth. It looks like um, Jeff has his hand up and then Dave, I'll go to you and then Mark. So I, I was just gonna say, I think one suggestion for that to maybe address it since obviously, you know, they're licensed site professionals probably much more adept at answering that question that Maybe a condition that simply would reflect something that says, you know, like prior to the start of work, a, uh, a flood control plan shall be filed with the commission. So that way they can get something in that says, if we feel that there's a winter storm that's coming or a flood that's coming, um, this is the plan and they can get it to everyone in advance for, for some review. And then they have a chance to start mobilizing and putting things together for the project, but then also know that before they start in earnest and, and breach that wall, uh, that they have to have a kind of a written plan in place. I, my gut feeling tells me that before they start, uh, they're probably going to have to provide that to a number of agencies as well, some way that they're going to control it. So I think that a condition like that would probably address that concern pretty, pretty thoroughly and give you guys another chance to review it. And if there's a question or concern with it, I'm sure you can simply go back to them and say, we don't think that's sufficient sure they'll fix it so or my guess is that this is not the first time they've done something like this somewhere but they can figure it out pretty fast <coughs> thank you jeff um so dave i think you maybe had a follow-up to that and then mark uh, through the chair yes i, I jeff kind of hit it right on the head I, I mean when you get to this level of construction i'm sure this is the first day in the sandbox for these guys and they're probably very highly skilled professionals in their industry. And, and they're gonna have um, it pretty well figured out. Uh, they don't want a mess on their hands. Um, I'm sure that, you know, they're in the velocity zone. It may mean uh, putting down some Jersey barriers and then it may, that may make it easier for them to seal it off with sandbags and stuff going forward. I'm not gonna design their project, but I have confidence that these guys will uh, We'll be doing the right thing and and then like jeff said if we could get it in writing uh, as their uh, protocol or how they're gonna um, go forward with it that would make me and i think all of you feel better thank you dave uh, mark yeah i would echo that about uh, the flood control comments just that i think that's very important actually that they have a uh, in in their in their um in their noi to have a a, a comment that they must provide a plan for flood control when they open up the concrete wall. And as maybe even as overseen or supervised or witnessed by uh, uh, resources staff. 
Yeah. No, I I'm agree. Sure it's not, not the first rodeo, but I want to make sure they they bring over enough product to uh, to, to stop some uh, a storm surge. Yeah. No, and I agree. I and it's not their first rodeo, but like on Nantucket, this is kind of a unique situation. So I think it's good that we um, dot all our eyes and cross our T's for sure. Uh, Joe and then Maureen. Yeah, I was kind of thinking like a plate of steel, something that would be as high as the the uh, dike wall. That way, it's just whatever the elevation height of the water, if it came up to and then sandbag, it'd feel a bit better. But that's I'd like to see it as high as the dike wall. I just think the choice of barrier is going to be low. But then again, like I'm not we're not trying to design it for them. But that is one concern I have. It's just I'd like it to be as high as that dike wall. Um, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, Maureen and then Jeff. Yeah, the, the thing I wanted to mention was obviously the, the police and fire departments are also overseeing part of this because everything we're talking about is public safety, you know, that we're worrying about right now are public safety concerns. So, and, and we have that letter from, from the police chief. Um, so the, the, I guess the, you know, I agree that we should put this condition in, but then do we need to, I'm just, how do we coordinate or make sure that, you know, each, uh, that they, that the police and fire know what we're doing and we know what they're doing. You know, I'm a little concerned about, about um, making sure that we, various pieces of the town know, you know, know what we're doing. I don't know, maybe Jeff, I don't know if you know about that or, or whoever, I mean, I, I just have a concern about that. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Jeff, do you know how this is going to get coordinated, I guess, between town entities? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, and I, it, it's no secret to anyone that all, a lot of us, Chief Murphy, Chief Pittman, uh, me, uh, Roberto at the health department, all of us have talked about this project and obviously understand that there's uh, a real importance to the project, one, to get the, the tanks and everything out of there, but also no uh, kind of longer term, especially that once the tanks are gone, you know, the real work is beginning, but we don't want to start off further behind than we necessarily have to. So I think everyone is very interested in making sure that it's there uh, and put forward. And I know from uh, talking to Dan as well that, you know, I think it's their intention to make sure that, you know, no one wants to shoot themselves in the foot on a project like this from the start, because it's going to be an involved and lengthy project. So I, I, I have feeling confident that everyone that's been involved so far has been pretty on top of what's happening out there and, and pretty well coordinated. Um, Jeff, I have one, one more thought as far as like flood control, but this would actually be like um, rainwater. I know they said that rainwater usually kind of goes to the middle of this site, but I guess I'm worried once they start removing the tanks and if they have trucks and it alters the topography like maybe we should have a condition about blocking the entrance for heavy rains too. I just don't want rainwater to end up coming out either um, if the topographic conditions change. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I, we can puzzle out some way to contain water to the site through the order, whether it's through, you know, both for flooding and for rainfall events, totally. I think that's fair. Uh, you know, I think one kind of similar project that, that comes to mind for me is one almost right next door, uh, where at one point we permitted some temporary flood barriers for the uh, the National Grid installation, kind of right next door. I don't remember who was on the commission then, but I feel like that was only three or four years ago, uh, where they had some pretty robust units that were brought in to prevent flooding from getting into the, to the substation that was there. Uh, so obviously those you know technologies are available and some of them may still be here, uh, but I think that, you know, it's obviously going to be the applicant's job to mobilize those. So I think whether it's for rainfall events that are going to be substantial or for flooding, I, I think there's a way to get to that. But I think we can puzzle the condition out for that pretty, pretty well. Thank you, Jeff. And I, Ian, was your hand up momentarily? Uh, oh, it was, Madam Chair. Just, you know, I, but um, since it's adjacent to the Anglers Club, it's in everybody's interest that it goes smoothly. So there's no interruption. Trust me when I say that the people that are sitting across the street from there on a daily basis are probably going to be ringing everyone's phone if something is going crazy because they, 
they got some busy bodies that sit in the English club for sure. So <laughs> I'm probably going to get my house egged by saying that tonight now, but you know, they definitely, uh, they got some good oh, watchdogs over there for, for sure. Football. But what I'm hearing is I'll, I'll draft up a positive order for, for next time that includes all those concerns and uh, we'll get some good review and, and get an issue. All right. Uh, thank you everybody for this discussion. Um, so this will move us on to extension requests. We have three North Gully Road LLC at seven North Gully Road, uh, represented by Jeff Blackwell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is a, uh, uh, the first three years of this order of conditions is about to expire. The uh, owner has had a close call, was almost able to acquire a house that would be move within um, Codfish Park, uh, but the deal did not pan out. So um, they would like a three-year extension uh, to allow for either acquisition of a, an existing house in Codfish Park or the actual construction um, allowed in the order. Um, the three years is beneficial from a um, perspective of, of uh, someone not just forgetting that the order is running out on a yearly basis. So I do ask for three years. Thank you, Jeff. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, and if not, is there a motion to issue the three-year extension, Joe? Uh, so, approval to the um, extension of three years. Okay, so motion made. Is there a second? Ian, did you just second it? Yep. Okay, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Goldborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. LaFleur? Aye. Phillips? Sorry, aye. Uh, Topham? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Me too. You too. Oh. Jeff Carlson? Yeah, just really quickly, I just wanted to give everyone a little bit of a heads up um, on extensions. So we're, we're, there's a good chance we might see a little flood of these here coming in soon because with the state of emergency ending in mass, uh, there was a permit tolling period that kind of was going on where permits, permits that were set to expire during the state of emergency by executive order were told. So um, we did a little exercise in here where we looked at starting from the March 10th date of 2020 um, to the June 15th, but that time period was, and if your permit was to expire in there, you essentially get the amount of days back from your expiration date back to March 10th. That's the way, um, <clears throat> that's the way that the guidance currently reads how it's to be evaluated. So we've gone through and looked at all of the permits and the meeting dates and issuance dates from 2017 and 2018, which would have been the permits to expire in 2020 and 2021 to kind of figure out when the tolling period would end on those. Um, it was an awesome exercise of math dates. Um, it would have been a really good like sixth grade project for learning how to use the calendar. But um, we have it. My guess is that we'll probably see a handful of projects look for extensions related to that because the tolling period is kind of long. So um, MACC kind of feels the same way. I know they've sent out a warning email to expect a uh, flood of requests for extensions with, with that. But uh, I think we have a pretty good handle on it. But I just wanted to let everyone know that we may be seeing a higher volume than normal with these. I recall this, the snafu we had on Lily Street. Yeah. So that was another tolling period one. It's just, they made it super confusing by setting it from the date and being able to go back for the expirations. I, I know Joanne and I both just wish they said that any permit that was set to expire in that time period, all of them are now going to expire on this date and just be done. But it's not just weapons permits, it's other, any state issue permit. So um, it's unfortunately not that simple. So hopefully it, 
know, this this re-entry from the state of emergency isn't as simple as we all hoped. <laughs> oh God, I wish. No, so well, it was a really great executive order at the time. So it definitely saved a lot of people headaches. But now coming out of it, we're all like, this is a crazy figuring out that you know my permit that was going to expire on you know January seventh, twenty twenty one, is now some weird time in twenty twenty two because that's the date going back. It's kind of well, thank you for the, the heads up and warning that we're going to be seeing numerous extension requests, most likely. Which means we'll Good see none. Good luck, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark? Uh, just uh, FYI, I think I have on my calendar penciled in uh, a Conservation Commission meeting on Monday the 21st for uh, Wisconsin Beach. Is that still active, Jeff? Yeah. So I think we're going to talk about that maybe in comments, but... I think that was moved to the 30th, right? Right. Yeah, I can talk about it now. We had to move that to the 30th because we had set that up, Mark, as a remote meeting, so over Zoom. And the legislation okay. hasn't passed yet to allow. So okay, we're I'm good. It's on the 30th now. I'll put the 21st for a site visit. Yes. Um, all right, so that uh, moves us on to approval of minutes from May 27th. Uh, Thank you, Terry, as always, for your minutes. Um, Love your bathrobe. You look cozy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Been looking at that all night. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that window is facing where the wind is coming from. It's right down the back of my neck. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ian, did you have a comment? Yes, uh, a minor detail, and uh, perhaps... It's none of my business, but uh, apparently Seth has had a sex change because on page five, he's referred to as Miss Arison. Oh no, wait a second. I've got a, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> I haven't seen you. <laughs> okay. All right. Close call, Seth. So we're good? Yeah. All right. Um... So if there are no uh, amendments to the minutes, does somebody want to make a motion to approve as drafted? So, uh, so I'll give the motion to Seth the second. I'm recused because I wasn't at that meeting, so. Okay, Maureen's recused. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Harrisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Lafleur? Aye. Topham? Aye. Right, that uh, carries with Commissioner Phillips recused. Um, and that moves us on to reports. We have crack. Uh, nothing to report. Okay, CPC. Nothing to report, Madam Chair. All right, NP and EDC. Nothing to report, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, that moves us to enforcement updates. All right, sorry about that. I had to step away to say goodnight to a very upset three-year-old that daddy wasn't there to read stories. So uh, we've been putting together and sent notices out after last time, kind of an entire list uh, of all of our active enforcements and have been slowly kind of getting responses in. So essentially what we did is we took all of the active enforcements, went back to the original representatives for the projects or open orders on those, uh, asking for a clear update. I know Joanne's been kind of forwarding those as they've come in on some of those projects to everybody. Uh, and she can correct me if, I, if I'm misremembering that, but I think that's correct. Yeah, and they're in the pack too. Uh, so we're still kind of rounding them up and then there are a few that aren't related to either open orders or anything like that, uh, that we've reached out to as well and we're just waiting to get some responses. And I think it was our intent to kind of let everyone know where we were. And then obviously, uh, hopefully we've heard from everyone by the next meeting. And if not, we'll just uh, take further action from there. But I think we're happy to take any questions on any of them specifically from what we have. Thank you, Jeff. Um, are there any uh, questions or comments about um, the enforcement updates in our packet? like no uh jeff sorry and one last thing and, and i know we were waiting to get all these updates in and, and i think at that point we'll probably send out the kind of the updated spreadsheet of enforcements to everybody to kind of keep tabs on 
Um, and I know we've been kind of discussing internally about maybe even having a spot on the town website where like a PDF version of that gets posted up as our active enforcement. But um, I know we'll probably check with council before we do something like that too, because I want to make sure that that's not causing some sort of harm that we shouldn't be, be causing. Yeah, I think that would definitely be helpful to have something up on the town website. I also don't know, like maybe in the future, because I know you and Joanne have a spreadsheet. If maybe we say like the first meeting of every month, that spreadsheet gets put in our packet or something along those lines. So it's just kind of a rolling check-in that's almost automatic. Um, or the last meeting of the month, just something. Yeah, I, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I, Joanne will throw her phone at me, but I think including the spreadsheet in the, the pack going forward, just for every meeting, I mean, it's just another PDF to add to the file. I don't think it's any heavy lift. We could just add it going forward, and I think that's fine. Yeah, I think that would be great if you could do that. Thank you. We'll Joe. email it to Joe too, so he can't get away. <laughs> um, should we? What about if uh, there's someone on there? I feel like I should recuse. Like, if we have to vote for anything, and I, and I know I'm getting off in a couple of meetings, but I'm noticing that there's someone I should not weigh in on. Is it best just to back out of this conversation? And what's the best way? So I think because we're talking about just kind of the process in general and updates and not anything specific, I think you're probably fine. And then yeah. if we get to something specific, you could just announce a recusal. Okay. Have a reason. But I think if everyone wants just all this stuff included just as the regular, like a regular pack piece of information, I think we're, we're happy to do that. Yeah, yeah it's just one project right now that I would have to recuse myself. Yeah. No, I, I think that would be great to have it in our regular packets and that way it maybe doesn't have to always be on the town website because the public can check in, you know, just with our packet information and then you maybe won't get into issues that town council would find. Yeah, I think that, I think it should be fine. Okay. Um, all right. So thank you for that. Well, that moves us on to commission. Oh, Mark. Hollywood farm, Jeff. The Hollywood farm. Yes, that is another one that I, I believe he is due. I'll have to check my calendar, but I believe that this Friday he is due for another citation for non-compliance. Um, so at some point he crosses a threshold where he goes into criminal complaint, but that is through the police. Well, we got to be getting close. Yeah, that, that's got to be a hefty. Got to be right there. Yeah, number that they've acquired at this point. I know they have issues with other town agencies as well, too. So. Um, so that moves us on to commissioners' comments. Um, any comments from commissioners? Um, I know I have um, one that's kind of involves um, enforcements in general, but also um, the potential enforcements with SBPF. And I'm just wondering, um, I know Jeff, sometimes you communicate with DEP about these issues, but somehow getting more open communication between like the commission and DEP so that we kind of have perspective on what we should do. And I don't know how we could appropriately make that connection with them. Um, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, totally. So um, not to, to, to jump in there, but through you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I, the last time I spoke to DEP about SPPF, I spoke to, uh, I don't know if you guys all remember Nate Corcoran. He was the kind of the caseworker for DEP on this, uh, was this morning. Um, we talked about SPPF. Um, but I think it would be just as simple if you guys would like. I mean, we could certainly invite him to the meeting on the 30th. And he can be present. I don't know. I don't know if he'll accept or, or if they'll let him, but we can certainly ask him to come and see what he says. But I do know on the phone today that we talked about a number of different options and his initial impression was that DEP would obviously be supportive of whatever path the commission decided it best to take is what he initially said. So 
take that for what it's worth, but I, I, I'm happy to reach back out to him and I'll probably reach out to his section chief as well, Dan Gilmore, and say, you know, we're having a discussion about the enforcement of this. Uh, we'd really love it if you guys could have someone participate or at least listen in um, and could decide your level of participation from there and, and see what they say. I do know, uh, you know, one of the things we talked about was obviously no secrets that everyone's talked about, either a way to, to make up the, the missing nourishment material um, from that to potential removal to other grand ideas. Um, and they did say today when I last spoke to him that they're also happy to review any you know plan or protocol that's put forward and, and throw their two cents in on it too. So um, I think maybe we start with the invite and see if they're willing to come. And then if not, we'll definitely uh, you know, take them up on the offer to, to do any review of whatever path we decide to go down. Okay, thank you for that. Because I think like with SPPF, that's fairly complicated. And even like a Hollywood farm where you just have this rolling kind of degradation of the resource areas, like, you know, how to, to tackle that. Um, so we have talked to them about Hollywood farm before too. And I, I, this is going to sound really awful is while they are supportive of the action the commission's taken, um, vegetated wetland violations for them tend, that they really go after tend to be much larger and much more substantial. Um, so I don't know if, if it's a threshold or a repetitive thing for them, but I'll, I'll happily bring it back up to them again. But I know the last time I talked to them about it, um, I believe their comment was, you guys are more than capable of taking care of this. So that's what they said. But, Small potatoes for them, yeah. I guess. Well, they, they talk about things like, you know, 50 acre wetland alterations. And I'm like, that would be like a huge chunk of Nantucket that would be altered. And for them, a 50 acre wetland alterations, like just getting going sometimes. So it's tough. It's a weird scale of, of stuff for them. So, um, well, thank you for your perspective, Jeff. Um, am I the only commissioner's comments? Looks like possibly. Uh, so we'll go to administrator staff reports. Yeah, so I, I don't think I was just going to re remind everyone of the change of the date for the SPPF thing for meetings. And then I was also just going to say that this is our last Zoom scheduled Zoom meeting for now, um, pending how uh, legislation goes through the state house. There may be ability to do it again. Um, I know we've inquired and uh, the town has even inquired up to to Julie and Sierra, Dylan Fernandez about being able to include a platform like Zoom in future just remote participation. So it's not just like by phone or conference to make sure that something like this is specifically allowed or called out. So if someone's gonna miss a meeting instead of calling in, they may be able to Zoom in instead. Uh, Cause I think it's always nice to be able to see what's going on too. And whether the town needs to update facilities to allow for that or However, that would work, but having it as a platform, I think, would be useful. So, um, I would love to see some level of remote meeting stay because I, I, I think participation has been good. It's I think it's easier for a lot of folks to be able to participate this way. So, I would hate to see it just go away because we think that's a good idea when it's a really useful tool. But that's it for me tonight. All right, uh, Joe. Yeah, it seems like everyone could still Zoom because we're all going to be sitting there with iPads or our computers. So it's just us linking to them or vice versa some way. But it seems like it's a pretty easy process that so it, we have some right in front of us. It seems like it, but honestly, <laughs> as somebody who's been hybrid teaching all year, having the screen and the live audience is like way more difficult than probably people who haven't been doing it realize. Okay. Um, but for like a George Pucci or, you know, those special people who are located off island or commissioner out, um, I think it's definitely valuable. Yeah. Well, I know, Madam Chair, if you thought it was difficult, I don't want any part of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'm out of here. <laughs> so I, I will say one suggestion that we had as part of it was if you do do a hybrid meeting, like in our case where we have two staff people and then a chair, is that, you know, like Joanne could manage the Zoom a little bit. And if there was something that came up, since she'll be there in person, she could alert the chair of the meeting to say, 
we have someone on Zoom that would like to comment. And then you're not trying to manage that. There's someone to do it. Not every board has that luxury, but I think for, for we would figure it out for sure. So, uh, Dave? Is, uh, is, are we going back to Wednesdays when our, with our in-person meetings? So right now, unfortunately, we're, we're still stuck to Thursdays for a bit because um, we kind of scheduled that way. And there's some, we're all having to share the first floor meeting room at the police station. And unfortunately, in the, the pecking order of meeting rooms, while well, you guys are a regulatory board and, and bump uh, a lot of boards, the one board that we do not is the select board. And they have kind of Wednesday nights on lockdown. So yeah. we're stuck yeah. where we are for a bit. Um, if more meeting spaces open up um, and are made available, I think there's just some concern about, you know, obviously there's still some want to, to do a little bit of social distancing in some cases and having some space to spread out um, and accessibility to areas. If there's more that come available, it may be possible to shift, but for right now, we're, we're still on Thursday. So sorry, Dave. All right. Um, yeah. I personally would be happy to, um, to be in the, the fancy room downstairs where we could actually put up the, you know, the things we're looking at up on the screen and we'd have comfortable chairs as opposed to being upstairs. I always feel like I'm at the school, a school meeting of some kind, you know, it's parent teacher conference with the, everything. So, um, so if this, you know, keeping the room at least isn't bad in my view, but. Um, well, I think whatever the town throws us is what we're probably going to end up with ultimately. So I'm glad we have Thursday meeting space. At least we've got something. Um, so at this point, uh, our agenda is over. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yes, Madam Chair. And I'm not a hologram, I might add. I'm just a Zoom 2D. <laughs> motion made by Ian. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Joe, so by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Harrisman, aye. Golding. Aye. LaFleur. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Topham. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. We'll see you in Bye. person next time. Bye-bye, Joe. <laughs> so if you accuse, drop the sign.